I uh, got it. Uh, how should I say so, do something? Oh, okay, I should say. That's the extent of my competence. So I begin by reminding you the last session. So in the last session, uh, I, finished the, I finished the second chapter of these lectures. The first chapter was about the attitude towards the mathematical object, taking it as a child of truth. The second uh, chapter was uh, about the attitude taking the mathematical object as presented. And uh, I, uh, I discussed the idea of uh, correlative objectivity, which means that uh, even the set theoretical object is presented to us but it's presented in a very strange way. It's just presented uh, through the stipulation of the axioms of the FC. And uh, then I discussed a, a new version, possibly a new version of this correlative objectivity, uh, which would be given by the notion of the classifying topos. And I discussed Laurent Laforgue's comments uh, he discussed the notion of the classifying topos of a geometric theory, and he seems to say that uh, the classifying topos realizes the move from the syntactic layer to the layer of the mathematical objects, which is exactly the move which I call correlative objectivity, because uh, the, the, the stipulation of the axioms happens at the syntactic logical level, and then uh, if, if this, if it has, if the, if, if the stipulation of this text has the presentative value, then it means that uh, from listening to the axioms, we jump to inhabiting a set theoretical world, a set theoretical universe, to use the classic. And uh, so <clears throat> Laurent Lafort seems to think that the classifying topos is the impersonation of uh, this. Um, layer of the mathematical object answering uh, the uh, stipulation of a geometric theory. And he thinks that, uh, that this move happens at the mathematical level uh, using category theory. Sorry, I have problems with moving. Is it so? Put it up. I'm, I'm stuck on the page. I cannot move. Is the cursor moves now? Is this uh, menu on the side? Of... Uh, oh, no, I moved. Okay. Did you? Yeah. So, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> Then I, I discussed this uh, uh, contention of Laurent Lafords, and I thought that it, it doesn't work as La Laurent Lafords says it does, because in order to build the classifying topos, you have to use, uh, in a very intense way, models in toposes, uh, which means that you you don't you have to presuppose the categorical the categorical world at least and probably even more because you have to consider a site, which means that you are considering the, the, the sheaves on a site. Mm -hmm. And uh, this involves set theory again. So you have to presuppose a lot of things in order to build the classifying topos, which proves that the construction of the classifying topos is not this, easily, this easy philosophical move from syntactic uh, logical level to uh, mathematical objects. And then I also compared uh, the classifying, the, class, the, the couple, uh, the, the ordered pair of the classifying topos and the associated universal model with Herbrand universe and canonical models in classical model theory. And, uh, <clears throat> I, be, because we have almost the same theorem uh, on both sides. And uh, I showed that. Uh, 
still Herbrand University is completely different from uh, classifying topos because Herbrand universe you, we may produce at the syntactic level and uh, so uh, I, my conclusion was that the, the classifying topos approach doesn't overcome the distinction between constructive and non-constructive semantics and then I discussed another uh, case uh, involving correlative objectivity, which is the re the, 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 the new axiomatization uh, of the non-standard effect by Nelson in his 1977 paper called Internal Set Theory. And uh, Internal Set Theory is a conservative extension IST of ZFC. And Nelson invites us to live this uh, new theory IST as having the same universe as ZFC has. We don't have to imagine any change of uh, uh, mathematical reality. Some problems with moving. Don't understand why. Yes, and so and I, I analyzed the reluctance of many mathematicians to live uh, uh, the, the IST universe as the same as the ZFC universe. And I, I showed that their reluctance uh, is because they see the situations in terms of models. So for them, uh, non-standard effect can only happen because we change the model. And uh, that's why they resist this notion that we are still with the universe and the same units. Only we have uh, the distinction between standard and non-standard objects, which change the, changes the atmosphere. So that means, so um, let me try to understand it for myself. So you're saying that um, once you fix a model, then you can ask the question whether it is also a model for IST. Once you fix a model for ZFC. Yeah. Then you can ask the question of whether it is a model of IST or not, but you can only answer that question if you have the model in front of you. Yeah, I, I and, and then if it, if it isn't, then you have to then you have to enlarge it to make the to make a model of IST. Yeah, you 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 can you you can ask these questions if you decide that you are going to deal with models. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, so you're that, you're that, committed that, to this you, model but, theoretic but you, thinking, but you don't have to do that. <clears throat> but a technical question. Are there, I suppose that the answer is yes, but we should. Are there model of uh, uh, standard analysis, I don't know, of an appropriate field, a complete field, etc., that are not model of IST? Or not? Yes. Yeah, yeah. You, you, the standard yeah. model is not a model of IST, or not? <laughs> well, if you... Okay, but then I understand that we are not to speak about model, but to understand. It, no, yeah, if you take an arbitrary model of ZFC, probably it's not a model of IST. And the proof of conservativity consists in uh, building a model of IST inside ZFC. I mean, L is, L is almost certainly not. Now I'm not speaking of S, uh, of uh, SATIO, ZFC. I'm speaking of a, a complete, a dedicated, complete, and totally ordered field. Are there and this is the axiom of this such a field is categoric. So I suppose that uh, they do not have models that have model of IST, correct? IST. Uh, 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 well, I, I don't know, you, you, you mean inside ZFC, you are referring to the theory of the reals inside ZFC? You can do it inside the IST or inside the second order logic or inside the, any setting. You, any setting second which order you can write, uh, yeah. in which you can write uh, 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 the axiom of a uh, static incomplete uh, and the totally ordered field. Then, of course, the model you have to look at the model somewhere. And so the model you take in ZFC, but the theory itself is not necessarily to be a sub theory of ZFC. But, but... In, but, in, in a way, still, the, the, the ID is the same, is that uh, the R of IST is exactly the same. And also, this, the, the, the only complete it is order supplemented field. with the distinction. 
Complete order fields are only categorical within a model of ZFC. So I know this, sorry. Uh, uh, complete ordered fields are categorical, but only in a fixed model of ZFC because there are countable models of ZFC. So it can't be categorical in, in, yeah. in uh, Jean-Michel's sense, right? Because you, I pick a different model, I pick a countable model. And certainly the, the complete ordered field is not the same as, as the one in what we imagine is the true ZFC model. That, it can't be. So categoricity is only can only be judged within a particular model of ZFC. I don't care if you want to pretend that second order logic doesn't use set theory, it's second order. So it certainly does use set, set theory. You have a notion of, of, uh, of ranging over subsets in second order logic. So you see what I mean? It, the categoricity is actually, all, it also has a parameter, which is which model do you mean this in? Just yes, but uh, to add to this, model of the details, I, com yeah. I completely agree with uh, uh, Drew's uh, uh, decision. But then I would uh, like to ask, uh, add one little thing: is that the R of IST is the uh, is the only R pointed at by the categoricity result inside the ZFC? Yes, but this is not yes, the yes. It has to be. Can yeah. construct That's right. within ZFC. You can construct a model of a complete or where the action can be started in the language yes. that you want. Yes. That is not a model of DST. So that does not include that it's not standard. I, 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 I think that you can do that. Yeah. Right? So I it think exists a model of the reals that do not include the real. Uh, no standard element. That technically, it's not a philosophical question. I want to know if technically this is true or false. Can, no, I think it's not true as you say it because uh, you, you you cannot add the distinction between uh, standard and non-standard if you don't have it. So, no, you don't have the language. point that may clarify the situation you're looking for. You're right because of categoricity within the model of ZFC. There is a, a essentially a unique model of the reals, but uh, because you are in ZFC and you can uh, extend that model to a with an ultra filter, you can get a model. No, of no, this, uh, this is clear. In which in which that is conservative. So, in, in a sense, uh, yeah, that's a good you point. don't know if you are looking at the reals as the complete field, which is unique, or you are looking at the part of another thing. No, oh, that's that is clear. That's, that's a good point. The point. That is the point. But what is uh, the point is technically speaking, you can construct a model, you can construct a complete sure. field that does not include probably does not yes, include yes. no standard. Yes. Well, no, yes. In in I yeah, see that's what you, want to say. Then what's that you know that is a philosophical reason. This is a mathematical fact. But, but but I think that this mathematical mathematical result, as you put it, is not clear enough because uh, the R we are dealing with in IST is exactly the R which is categorized by uh, uh, the classical approach of uh, an ordered field which is complete. Uh, but but this in IST, this exact, this very R has non standard elements because of the grammar of the ST, non -ST, not ST distinction. So it, it doesn't have elements as something which is added and which, we, which you can grasp through the hyperproduct uh, construction. In this it has these elements because of the grammar. So, so I do not understand how this is. Yeah, because you, because you, can, you, you can prove okay. that there is an element that is smaller or greater than any other element. So there is an infinite yeah, Because there is a monad. But in the other model, you prove that there is not. So these objects are not there. You, you don't prove that in a model. You prove that in IST. And you use the grammar of ST, and, uh, the grammar of ST which is given by the three actual schemes. It's, it's not a property of the model. That's something you, do, you, you resist, you don't understand that. 
The, that, that's the whole idea is that the, 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 the property of having the non-standard effect is not, the, is not correlated with the situation of a particular model. It's given by the grammar. Yeah, maybe you yeah, no, no. I so that's right. I that's, so. understand that, that we can and we should not reason with models theoretically. And I totally agree with that. I decided it in, in an auto vocation. I totally agree with that. But when we reason is not in, in not a, a model theoretic uh, ways, we cannot forget that it's also possible to reason model theoretic way. So now I try to make clear the situation in terms of model theoretic, in model but theory. You then you can decide that you to reject that way of thinking and you think in another way. You, you cannot do that because the idea of IST is that in any usual model of the of the reals, you have not It is false. It's, no, it's, no, it's, it's clearly it's, false. No, it, no, it's, 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 it's true. It's true, but it's not true at the level of uh, individual objects. It's true at the level of the grammar. So here, the, I, I, so Pino's right, but you were, you, you hit on a, an important point because this, um, I take a model of ZFC, I build the, the, I build the reals. I have a set and it has the property and, and its structure. So now it's a complete ordered field. Now I pick an ultra filter. I extend this. So now I have a model of IST sure. and that same set, that is its translation. It's, it, 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 it's, it moves up. It is also a closed ordered field, but grammatically you have to change the theorem a little bit because now you can only mention standard elements in that statement, in that characterization. I mean, in that right? case, that's what that's what happens when you well, take an ultra filter. When you take an ultra power, the theorems that are translated across. Well, it's not conservative. So it's no, 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 no. It's it's it's. Sorry, go ahead. Well, yeah, you were going to say. I, I'm going to say that uh, I I think you're both right because <laughs> but, but you're speaking of modern theory as if it is outside as a, whichever universe you're in, while instead modern theory has to be performed within your set theory where you are. Exactly. And that's, and that's the point of the problem. Yes. I think that's, that's the point. And, and Jean-Michel has been trying valiantly, heroically to try to get us to realize yes. that mathematicians are pointed toward this non-model theoretic picture because we have an idea of what sets are rather than a model of sets. Your question exactly. brings us back to models. But anyway, yeah. I think the philosophical way to understand the situation is to understand it in a Wittgenstein way because uh, IST gives you a new grammar. And if you have a new grammar, <coughs> you relate differently to any re possible reality. And that, that's, that's the Wittgenstein idea. So the, the, the fact that we have, that the, the great teaching of IST is that the fact that you have non-standard elements is not triggered by a, an objective for, uh, prior uh, pro, uh, property. It's not because you have to recognize some infinitesimals because they if they are imposed to you by the uh, set theoretical objects, it's because of the grammar. That, that's the whole idea. And it, it's, it's quite close from the way Lazar Carnot was saying the infinitesimal. He said that an infinitesimal is something which is smaller than any, than any given quantity. And what he called given quantity, he introduced a, a distinction, a language distinctions between assigned quantities and non-assigned quantities. And an infinitesimal was something which is smaller than any assigned quantity. That was his words. So uh, mm -hmm. th th that's, that's, that's the path of IST. You introduce in the language the distinction between assigned and non-assigned, and then you have non-standard, whatever the reality, the set theoretical reality is. That's the point. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I came to the conclusion that the reluctance of a lot of mathematicians to understand this IST situation uh, is because they want to think in terms of model. Uh, they, they think they inhabit a standard ZFC universe, which, we, which they cannot really define. And uh, they think that in order to get non-standard elements, you have to change this reality, driven by reality. And, uh, and, in and then I paralleled this notion of uh, uh, 
I, th I think it's another way of seeing correlative objectivity as mathematically internalized, because you cannot see correlative objectivity at the level of a universe, which is an effect of the stipulation of the axons. Uh, you, you, you only see it at the level of models. Models is the part which is mathematically controlled. So uh, you, you think that your axiomatic stipulation has been mathematically internalized. Same with the classifying topos. Uh, Laurent Laforgue thinks that the classifying topos mathematically internalizes the move from syntactic logical level to mathematical objects. So the, con the, so the, two, the, two, the, the two conceptions would be the same in that, in that perspective. Now I move to uh, the third chapter, which is uh, uh, seeing the mathematical object as showing difference without concept. So uh, it's, it's, it's not, uh, it's a completely different approach because in the first two approaches, in the first two attitudes, uh, we were uh, looking at the mathematical object in a foundational way. Uh, Either we, we, for people who are seeing the mathematical object as child of truth, or for people who are seeing the mathematical having been presented, in both cases, it's the idea of uh, determining uh, legitimate origin of the mathematical object. And uh, because we have this legitimate origin, we are able to accumulate mathematical truth. So in both cases, it's a foundational version of the mathematical object. And now uh, to, to, see, to, to see the mathematical object as showing difference without concepts, it's completely different. We forget about the origin, about the legitimacy. Uh, only we, we are trying to track some property of the mathematical object, which is unusual uh, compared to, to our empirical relation to objects. And this property is the property of showing difference without concept. And we first find this property in Kant. So as you could know uh, in uh, the section of uh, critique of pure reason, which is called amphibology of concepts of reflection, which comes at the end of uh, transcendental analytics, Kant argues against Leibniz's principle of indiscernibles and I have written this principle. It says that uh, two objects which share the same properties are the same. So if for all property P, P of X is equivalent to P of Y, then X equal Y. And uh, Kant thinks that this principle of indiscernibles is true for things in themselves, but it doesn't concern phenomenal entities. And here comes the quote from uh, Kant, which we have to read carefully. No doubt, if I know a drop of water as a thing by itself and in all its internal determinations, I cannot allow that one is different from the other when their whole concepts are identical. But if the drop of water is a phenomenon in space, it has its place not only in the understanding among concepts, but in the sensuous external intuition in space. And in this case, the physical place is quite indifferent with regard to the inner determinations of things, so that the place B can receive a thing which is perfectly similar or identical with another in place A, quite as well as if it were totally different from it in its internal determinations. Difference of place by itself and without further conditions renders the plurality and distinctions of objects as phenomena not only possible, but also necessary. This is a very important quotation. And what Kant says here is mostly that position hmm. is something completely different than uh, what is given by the conceptual space. Uh, a difference of position uh, cannot be counted as a conceptual difference. Uh, space allows us to locate data and 
in a completely different way than what we do when we are locating data at the level of conceptual discrimination. Kant says a phenomenon in space has its place not only in the understanding among concepts, but in the sensuous external intuition in space. So you see, there are two frameworks for locating things. We have the conceptual framework and we have the intuitive framework. And uh, it's perfectly possible that things are completely identical at the level of the conceptual framework, but they have different locations in this the intuitive is, framework. This is interesting because in this is in this is one way of characterizing what a fermion is mm -hmm. in physics. What? A fermion is a particle yeah. whose internal structure all all electrons are exactly identical except for their positions. Yeah. For example, so, you know, I know it's so hard to hear. I, I, I usually use this example to show that uh, finally physicists introduce a difference without concept in, in their conception of physical yeah, reality. Yeah, exactly. Right. So uh, <clears throat> I could not agree more. Uh, so uh, points in space. Ah, show therefore a difference without concept. It's, it's a very simple example because they, their position differ, uh, but we can we cannot give any conceptual content to this difference. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that uh, uh, mathematics uh, gives us that kind of situation. It's not only uh, the geometrical example Kant has in mind. I, I think mathematics perturbates our too easy notion of identity, which means that uh, we have a lot of ways uh, in which uh, mathematical objects are able to be numerically different, but lacking any conceptual difference. And uh, my point is that is also that this, this possibility of having difference with concepts with uh, the Platonish, Pla Platonician ideal character of the object. So here I am telling you again the story of uh, Plato's notion of idea. So I'm trying to figure the conception of the idea of the beautiful. And the idea of the beautiful is supposed to be one and invariant above a plurality, which is the plurality of beautiful things. So you have a lot of beautiful things, A, B, C, and T. So A such that P of A, it means here P of X means X is, X is beautiful. And you have the idea of the, of the, of the beautiful, which is above one and, and invariant. <clears throat> If we forget about the, the, the conceptual differences between the various beautiful things, then uh, we only have a numerical difference between them as cases of the idea of the beautiful. And uh, such attitude seems to be allowed, even if it's not mandatory. Well, I, I, I could add here that uh, I think I have to add it to to remind you more the Platonician situation. The idea is other than any beautiful thing. The idea of the beautiful is other than any beautiful thing, mm -hmm. but still it's only presented through right. uh, beautiful things. Mm -hmm. So it means that in some sense, you cannot find an, 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 an adequate ontological place for the idea of the beautiful because other than anything, but at the same time, only presented through these beautiful things. So in a way, it has no place. And I think we have to accept this paradox of the idea of the Platonian idea. But this is, I mean, that it has no place. It's, it, it doesn't it depend on having a cumulative conception of sets so that the elements come first and then you collect the elements into sets, but you don't have to, right? So you could also have a conceptual set theory where the sets are just given, and then I have a way of observing, oh, is this in the set, yes or no? But I don't have to put the elements first and then the sets as derived, and also start the other way around. Well, here you are, you, you take for, 
obvious that uh, the idea is the set of beautiful, the idea of the beautiful, which I don't take as obvious. I think in, in Plato's presentation, you don't have that. Uh, the idea of the beautiful is only one invariant above beautiful things. Well, what, like you, what, what, you, what you what you know is that. The the, well, uh, so then uh, Aristotle says that uh, uh, the idea of the beautiful has no separate uh, place. But that's not what he said. No, I I, I I agree with him in a way. I think there is a paradox. And it's, it's, it's impossible to overcome it. No, but I say it's possible. You just have to invert uh, uh, the, uh, whether the elements come first or the sets come first. But you can tell it. If, 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 you want, right? if, if you take the idea as being the, the set, but you don't, it's, it's not like that. The idea of the beautiful is one and invariant above. Uh, and Every beautiful thing uh, partakes uh, the idea. That's what you. That's what in in, in Plato's language. So, but and then, I think if you follow the story of Plato, it's very own level. There is a paradox, which means that you, you cannot locate ontologically the idea, and uh, mm -hmm. and that's what Aristotle. So, and the th I think the third man argument was intended to show that this uh, notion of the ID is not logically uh, stable and acceptable. But still, I think it's the ID, and I think we need the uh, we need the ID of ID in that way. So, <clears throat> so you could say, try to tell the same story by uh, presenting not. The cone, the, 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 the cone of the ID, but the cone of the concept. And here is the cone of abstraction. Uh, you are telling the same story. You have beautiful things, A, B, C, and T, and you abstract the concept of beautiful, of beauty, of beautiful. And uh, how do you abstract it? You abstract it as the common feature to all the things that you listed above, below. And uh, I think that if, if, the, if you see the, uh, the, the cone as uh, promoting the concept and not the idea, uh, the concept is a linguistic predicate. Well, the idea is an object, it's completely different. Uh, but if you see the things that way, if you abstract the concept, and then uh, this concept is the common feature, which means that you contrasted the common feature with other features which were not common. So you considered properties of uh, objects below, and you retained, you kept only their common property, which means that uh, the concepts which distinguish between A, B, C, and T, they have been considered in the process of abstraction. Because, because you've discarded them. Because you explicitly discarded them in, yes, in exactly, forming the concept. Exactly. So you had to have considered them. Yes. Okay. That that's my sense. point. <clears throat> <clears throat> then I come further to show you that this notion of uh, the Platonician ID, we need it because it's involved in our notion of constructive. Constructive of if you, if I consider natural numbers as constructive objects, as you know, they arise through symbolic repetition. Uh, for example, you could you could uh, see five as the repetition of five strokes, or you could see five as s s s s s s zero uh, by using uh, the names of five the name of five in a formal system. Uh, so syntactic constructive objects, I took the example of uh, formulas of propositional, they also show symbolic repetition because you, in, in the formula you can, uh, you can use as a resource a variable many times. For example, in the formula P entails Q or P, I use P twice. And even uh, I have repetition, which is I have other repetitions are triggered 
by the construction tree of the formula. For example, I can repeat a sub-formula as many times as I want. For, for, uh, here is my example. I have the formula P entails Q or P, and it is repeated twice in this big formula. P entails Q or P, or uh, uh, P and Q entails P entails Q or P. So here you have P entails Q or P twice. So I insist that uh, we have symbolic repetition of letters anyway, uh, in case, uh, and it's a case of the ideal cone, and you have this case of the ideal cone that the letter A is supposed to be one and invariant above all uh, possible uh, uttering of A as a phoneme, I would say, or uh, any writings of the letter A. So these are occurrences of the letter. And the letter, what I call the letter A, is supposed to be one and invariant over all these variations of special writings or proferations of utter or utterings of A. And in that case, the difference between cases is forgotten because the pragmatic of language means exactly that we don't consider differences among what Hemsher called variants. And I remember that the Hemsher's son, you, you gave us one paper from uh, Hemsher's son or something, if I remember well. Uh, so, uh, I, and I think here we have the same paradoxical difficulty because uh, what we call the letter A, it has no place in our ontology uh, because we only have occurrences, we only have variants. And uh, the letter A, we cannot grasp it. Uh, it's supposed to be one and invariant over all our variants, be, 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 they, be they written or be they uttered. Uh, but anyway, you cannot grasp uh, the letter A. Uh, it's, the, it's the same difficulty that we had with the Platonician idea. So uh, in this new chapter, my contention is that mathematical object gets affected in a very profound and essential way by difference without concept. And sometimes difference without concept comes through the ideal code because it's, it's a case of difference without concepts when we have an idea which dominates a lot of occurrences. And in that case, these occurrences, there is no conceptual difference between them. In the case of constructive objectivity, it, ob it, it overlaps perfectly because uh, uh, constructive objecti uh, objectivity is totally made out of re symbolic repetition. So in that case, difference without, concept, without concepts is exactly measured uh, and uh, framed by uh, uh, the ideal co. But what happens in uh, non-constructive mathematics? I understood the math. I tried to explain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, when you deal with uh, natural numbers, the idea of repetition, let's say, explains it. How about the inductive principle? That's the basic idea of natural numbers, induction. Yeah. Can you deal in the same way with the induction principle? Um, the repetition explains, let's say, natural numbers, individual yes. objects. But when we take the whole structure, we need an induction principle. Yeah, I don't say, I don't, I don't, I, my point is not that, constructive reasoning is completely made out symbolic repetition. There is more. The, the, you have the induction on the construction, but you also have in, in, in constructive reasoning, you have a, a, a schematic approach of the general construction. In any kind of constructive reasoning, usually people, they use that. They, they also... I, I try an yeah. answer to that. Uh, in my view, induction is a way to express something which is uh, very intuitive for us, and we give it for understood as human beings. 
namely that when you construct points like strokes you do not consider anything else the elements of natural numbers are just those obtained in that way but it's very hard to say it formally and and induction has uh, this role i don't think it's so natural because i don't think it's so natural because <clears throat> Nowadays, we take it, let's say, as a Pascal induction. Greeks have a bit different idea of induction. It was the least uh, element of the set. So there are different kinds of inductions. That, that is my proposal. OK. Uh, what, I, I agree <laughs> with uh, uh, Giovanni uh, in the sense that uh, there is a connection between in of repetition and in a way for us induction comes uh, naturally from the symbolic repetition but still there is a, techni a technical status of induction and that's what you underlined but i think both both views are not contradictory i understand that you speak too lo loud and it is too it's, i'm here but I, I, I yeah that well, i don't know where to start with your, uh, you're not understanding. No, no. We are in the United States. To get the United United States, States uh, at least turn uh, off for Someone today. else decided that uh, our condition has to, there's no way to stop it. God decided. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand. I see that you speak too. Too slow? Not too slow. Soft. Soft. Too soft? Yeah, you have to shout at I, I should shout more. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I can try, but uh, I'm not sure I'm going to. It's going to be easy for me. Because that's not my nature. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but the yeah. voice is completely covered. But it's already OK, I see. Uh, so, but I think we, we also have variance in non-constructive mathematics. And, and I come to that now. So I'm going to consider what I call structural variant variance. No, but sorry, if I try to explain me, what is the difference that you identify between the difference without concept within the conceptual co uh, cone and outside the conceptual cone? Please, I don't understand the difference that you want to make. Yeah, I say in the case of uh, symbolic repetition, you have differences without concepts which are the differences of the cases of the ideal, uh, dominating ideal uh, entity. And uh, these differences are given by the, ide by the ideal code. And I think it applies in general to constructive objectivity. In the case of constructive objectivity, we have difference without concept given, given by the ideal code. And here I'm considering other part of mathematics we are, we are not dealing with constructive objectivity, but we are going to have, again, structural var variants, as I call them. So uh, I, I first consider the set theoretical case. We know that we have an object which carries a structure in set theory. We are able to replicate this object with the structure in any other part of the universe, at least as, as soon as we have enough cardinality. So uh, if, if we have, uh, for example, uh, something which is R exponent R uh, with uh, any kind of topological structure, you, you, may, uh, you can replicate that uh, in any other part if you have uh, uh, cardinality enough. So you, you, you can have an isomorphic replica of any structured object inside set, set theory. And, uh, that's, that's the first example of an isomorphic re replica. And, and then in the context of category theory, you, I'm going to speak about two things. First, you have a local version of isomorphic objects. Object A and object B in category C are equivalent if we have aroused U from A to B 
and V from B to A, such that V composed with U is the identity of A, and U composed with V is the identity of B. So in that case, A and B are equivalent within the category C, which means that they constitute an intracategoric repetition. Uh, in the first case, we had a uh, set theoretical repetition. And we also have the notion of equivalence of categories and categories C and D are equivalent if we, if we have functions F and G going from C to D and from D to C such that uh, the composition of uh, G and F is the identity of category C and the composition of F and G is the identity of category D. So two equivalent categories are a repetition from the point of view of categorical geist, as I could call it. As much as they may differ, they may differ strongly at the set theoretical level, for example. So isomorphic structures at the level of set theory, equivalent objects within a category or equivalent categories are three distinct notions. But uh, there is a common feature is that uh, locally relevant concepts or machinery don't distinguish them. There is a sense in which we don't distinguish between isomorphic structures or equivalent objects or equivalent categories. But this is clear, but why it is not the case of the difference without concept within the conceptual code? I do not continue want to see the difference that you want to make of this phenomenon that is fundamental in mathematics or distinction between concepts within and outside the conceptual code. It is different, I do not understand. Yeah, well, uh... Simply, uh, in the case of constructive objectivity, difference without concepts is directly given by the code, by the ideal code. And here, mm -hmm. it's, it's completely different. You, you have universe, which is a big principle of spreading things. And you, you have one, th one structure of things somewhere, and you can spread. You mean that in constructive objectivity, any object that you distinguish from any other, is individually given at a certain point. So it has an individuality that is marked by a sign, for example, or a part yeah, by an ideality. Attention on focus, what you want. Yeah. So I, I give in the, when when I'm speaking in the case here outside, I know that there are objects that are different without concept, but I do not able to identify each of them individually. This is what you mean? I don't identify them as given by an ideal code. So. Imagine that you are in F2, okay? This is an object and this is a point, and this is a point. <laughs> I cannot distinguish them uh, conceptually before that I have distinguished them non-conceptually. When I distinguish them non-conceptually, I can say it is on the left, it is on the right. But I cannot do it before. So this is not the case uh, because I at this point, I have this point. So this is a case within the conceptual code, if I understand or not. It's, it's not conceptual code. Here, here is spreading, there is a, a spreading principle which uh, that's, that's Kant's example. In Kant's example, we have difference without concept. It's Kant's example, exactly. Yeah, that, that's Kant's, in, in Kant's example, we have a difference without concept and it doesn't come as given by an ideal code. It comes because we have points. Uh, ideal point, concept is this one, element of two. Element of two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, because you, you, you take concept as, uh, for, for you, ID is immediately the same as concept and it's the same as set. No, 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 no but uh, no, it, it, in what you say now, it seems to be so. Because for you, the fact that you have the space, the space is like an ideality of which occurrences would be the point. I think Kant doesn't describe it that way. That's right. Kant does not take... Uh... Position as a property. Location is not a property. 
account. That's the problem. And it's not convincing. <laughs> no, but I don't see why it's like that. But the concept, if you want to speak in terms of concept, is is element of F2. Say it in this way. It is a concept and it is a certain object, A, that is an element of a two or not. It's not an element of a two, I'm not an element of two, it is an element of a two. So I have a concept. Yeah, I, I understand in the way you 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 want to you you want to treat any uh, uh, case of difference without concepts as a case of the abstract equal. I understand you. It's, it, it, it goes with what I know of your personality, your philosophical personality. <laughs> uh, but I do not see how you can avoid it. No, I, no, I, I, no I, 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 don't, I, I don't treat it. I simply say that in Kant's description, you have the difference of position between points, and you don't have an ideal unity of these points. These points are say not, point. This point. Say point. Say point. It's a concept. Say point. So we know it. No, what I call they a, are, again, what point. I call an ideal unity is not a concept. It's an object which comes before, and uh, object uh, uh, so uh, occurrences are participating. Is an object. I don't. I don't. I, 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 I'm, I'm not taking, I, I, I think space here works as a principle of spreading. And that's exactly how Kant describes it in the quotation I read. So we, we have points which are cases which show difference without concepts. And these, these positions are, uh, they, they are related to space as a principle of spreading. Exactly as like uh, isomorphic replicas in set theory, they are they 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 are given by the universe of sets as a principle of spreading, and it's it's not as uh, it's it's not as occurrences of an idea. So uh, let me try to see whether I understand. You say that space here work as a sort of condition of possibility of the distinction. So the space is what allows me to say this. But before say this, is there before saying this? Yeah, it's uh, when I say this, I I exploit the possibility the space gives to me to identify something without a yeah. You okay. can you can I, I I'm not against the, the the formulation condition of possibility, but I prefer principle of spreading. But, uh, so no, no, because condition of the word that you invented. So there are no, no, no I, I mean no condition, condition of literature. So I do not understand what you mean. No, we have, it's difficult. Condition of possibility. I know there are three hundred years that philosophers discuss about condition of possibility. No, but I'm, 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 afraid, I'm afraid that if you take it as condition of possibility, you are going to give some ontological anchor to space again. Well, I don't see it as an anchor. I see it as a principle of spreading. We have a lot of points. And it's true that space in, in, in Kant's conception is a priori, which means that we relate in some way to uh, this principle of spreading before considering any particular point. That's right. But I think that condition of possibility, it, 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 it brings a lot of difficulties with it because possibility is going to be understood as real possibility by a lot of philosophers during, the, during centuries. So that's why I prefer principle of spreading. So uh, the practice to be so spreading, uh, nobody understands except you. <laughs> oh, but I like it. <laughs> okay, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you see, you, you, you feel no, that I there is something. That. Los Angeles is a principle of spreading. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that's why I love it. <laughs> and, and, and I had in mind, for example, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Every time this phrase. <laughs> a philosopher from New York, he told me uh, once that. Yeah. <laughs> Describing a city, I, I don't remember which one, but I said that everything is here kind of scattered. Kind of? I think kind of scattered, it's a way of, uh, of saying that things are like distributed by a principle of spreading. 
I don't have a particular opinion in this discussion. <laughs> Because I, I'm not sure I understand the terms. Anyway, it reminds me of a similar discussion that uh, goes on in the constructive uh, community, uh, including philosophy of, of it, uh, about uh, what is a choice sequence. Because there, what is the concept? Uh, when can you say two are the same? When can they say their difference? different and so on. So that discussion seems to be related to the discussion here. Probably it can be related, but I don't see immediately. No, I also <laughs> don't. <laughs> but I believe it can. <laughs> so that's what I just say in the three cases. Difference without concept doesn't concern immediately, obviously, occurrences of the same ideality. Uh, it, 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 so it rather comes according to a principle of spreading, which is given by the universe of sets in the first case, by the universal game of categories and categorical situations in the third case. The situation seems to be the same as in Kant's original case, where space provides the principle of spreading. So I, uh, I just repeat what I just said. And now I move to homotopy type theory. Uh, because it seems that we have uh, nowadays a kind of foundation, foundational theory which claims to be able to host all kinds of mathematics and which seems to introduce as a key component difference without concepts or something like that. But I, I'm not sure of it, so I'm going to give you the reasons why it seems to me to introduce the notion of difference without concepts, homotopy type theory. Uh, I'm not sure of it, so maybe you will show me how I should understand better homotopy type theory. First, homotopy type theory seems to cover our cases of structural variance. We shall see that. So, uh, homotopy type theory uh, aims uh, to prov at providing uh, new foundations to mathematics. And uh, from what I heard, uh, Wodowski uh, thought that it could avoid uh, mistakes. Uh, if we do, if we work with, with the homotopy type theory, we are not going to be able to mistake anymore. And it is laid down in a constructive language inherited from Martin Love, the language of type theory, of dependent type theory. And the, the important point, which intersects my discussion is that hot homotopy type theory offers a new conception of equality. We learn if we, leave, if we read uh, hot that uh, we have a, a propositional equality on, one's, on one hand and judgmental equality on the other hand. So we have two kinds of equalities. Only judgmental equality seems to mean identity. So what we are dealing with is the uh, philosophical relation between identity and equality. And uh, I don't have to remind you that it's already Frege's issue in the famous Sinn und Bedeutung paper, because Frege asks, how come that sometimes we assert A equal B, meaning something else than A equal A? So he's already with this problem of identity and equality. So if A is an object of type A and B is another object of type A, we may write a propositional equality, which is A equal B in the type, in the type A. But uh, that, that's, that's an example of a propositional equality. And here now is an example of judgmental equality we may determine a function f from type a to type b by something like f of a equal a square, where this symbol stands for judgmental equality. So as far as this, the second equality, the judgmental equality 
determine, determines the function, it seems to spell out a necessity. Why the propositional equality seems to be contingent. Uh, it happens that A and B are equal. So then, uh, as you know, uh, the underlying thought in HOT is that uh, any propositional equality backed by an entity witnessing for it. So we write P uh, X equal A Y. It means that uh, we have an identification P in the type X equal A Y of X and Y. So equality seems not to be ontologically given, but we assert equality in the name of an underlying identification. Uh, and so uh, we have the great uh, new idea, which is that for any two objects within a type A, we have a new type, which is the type of identifications of these two objects. And uh, among identifiers of X and X, one is privileged and it's given by the theory and it's uh, written refl sub X and it stands for self-reflection of X identifying X with itself. So it's identifier of identity, ref of X, ref sub X. So uh, and in general, uh, <coughs> homotopy type theory asks us to conceive a, a, an identification of X and Y as a path connecting X and Y. So the, the, th the theory seems to treat propositional equality as something which is illuminated by a topological path binding Y to X. So uh, it seems to picture <coughs> identification <coughs> as happening to different entities. Provide us uh, an example, a simple example of this idea. No, I, I'm, 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 here I'm just giving the formalism of uh, huh? the homotopy type theory. <coughs> So I'm, I'm going to deal with examples, but uh, when, when I will try to, when I'm going to try to express my difficulties. Uh, so uh, Hart seems to describe mathematics as dealing with objects likely to get identified. And uh, also uh, identifications are, theirs, are themselves new objects. And any two objects of a type define a new type of their identifications. So does this idea that we are immersed in a realm of objects able to get equalized means, does it mean that we have numerical difference without concept? If objects are different, but they are equalized, does it mean that they are, they are different without concept because they are equal? After? And uh, the, here we should understand better the relation of equality with identity in HOT. Uh, because uh, HOT's identifications at first sight do not seem to obey identity as an authoritative principle. It doesn't seem that HOT explains equality through identity. So, uh, but then we have the path induction, induction principle which seems to remind us that we cannot systematically think equality far away from identity. But before presenting the path induction principle, I have to consider product and some, some types. So here I, I, go, I go further uh, with the formula, formalism of uh, homotopy type theory. Uh, homotopy type theory introduces family of types family of types is given by something like P from A to U, where A is a type and U is a universe of types. Type of types, large enough for hosting for any X of type A, the type P of X, which means that P of X for any X of type A is going to be a type. And we suppose that the universe U is a type of types large enough to have inside it any type P of X for X varying in A. 
doesn't have to be a, a universal type of all types because that would be dangerous. And uh, on the basis of such family of types, we define two types, which is the product type P of uh, P of X for X varying in type A and sigma sum of P of X for X varying in type A. And an element F uh, witnessing the tape, the product type, uh, has for each x of tape A a value f of x, which is in type P of x. So it's a generalization of the classical notion of function. In, in the classical notion of function, for every x of type A, we would have f of x uh, belonging to type B. And uh, in that case, uh, the type uh, of fx varies, varies with x, which means that it's, it will be p of x for each value. But probably in order to define this function f inhabiting the type, the product type, we will need a judgmental equality. f of x equals uh, phi with phi uh, an expression in variable x which is going to be always of type of type p of x and uh, we have also the the sum type which is the disjoint sum of types p of x which means that a, an ordered pair a b is member of the the, the sum <coughs> type when A is of type, type A and B is of type P of A. So it seems that the sum type, uh, sum for X varying in A in type A of P of X, it gathers fibers P of X over each X of type A and it distinguishes each of these fibers. So that, then if I look at uh, these two Product, product and some types uh, from the logical point of view, which means I, I use the proposition as types uh, uh, principle, then a proof of uh, the product type is a function associating to each X of type A, a proof P of X of type P of X, small P of X of type great P of X, and in the sense of the BHK explanation, this is a proof of for all X, P of X. And we verify easily that uh, an ordered pair of the sum is exactly a proof of exists, exists X such, such, such that P of X, again, in the sense of BHK explanation. So here is uh, the pass induction principle. Uh, it says that uh, uh, if we have a family of types C, uh, which is uh, in, in, in the product of uh, for X, Y in, in type A of X, X equal <coughs> sub A, Y entails U. And if we have a function C uh, of uh, product for X varying in A of C of X, X ref of X, ref sub X, there exists a function F uh, of, the, or, or, of, uh, of P for X, Y of type A and P an identification of X and Y say x c x y p such that f of x x ref x ref sub x judgmentally equal to c of x so it means that to have a function so the situation where we have, where we have a family of types uh, of, of given uh, of c great c uh, which for every uh, X, Y of type A uh, gives a type of uh, X equal 
sub A, Y, and J is U. This is exactly the same as having one type uh, for each triple X, Y, and P, an, identi an identification of X and Y. So it, it, it means that for every uh, X, Y, and P, we have a type. That's, that's, that's the idea. Uh, and then the path induction principle is, says that in order to have a function which for uh, every x, y, and pi is going to have a value in the type c of x, y, and p, uh, it's enough that we have a, such a function in the case where we have, instead of identifications, identities x, x, and a ref sub x. If we have a function defined on identities, we have a function defined on identifications. So we have a function, uh, as, as soon as we have a function doing the same job when we consider self-reflections only instead of general identifications. So it seems to say this path induction principle that identity still controls what happens to identification. Uh, it's enough that we have a function working on identical reflections for having a function working on general identifications. So that's the way uh, uh, things are put in uh, what Michael Schulman calls book homotopy type theory. Book homotopy type theory, it's the book we find online. And uh, so here in book homotopy type theory, path induction is an axiom. It is added to the axioms of Hot. And yes. If I may add a comment to yes. what uh, Mike Schulman says, yeah. uh, he calls it book because it's online and, and the authors keep correcting it. Yeah. So it changes through time. Okay. And, and it's, 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 a, it's an undefined notion of book, I think. Okay, <laughs> right. you're right, right, you're right. <laughs> because there are different Swiss concepts. Yes, I mean, you have to put the book <laughs> on the day you read it. It's an instance yeah. of what it changes. So in my memory, because he gave a talk here in 2022, and he, he doesn't take path induction as a new action. He proves it. And he proves it uh, from the requirement that a function uh, uh, transforms identif identifications into identifications. We have, uh, if x is identified in type A with, with y, then f, f of x and f of y are going to be identified. And, uh, and he proves this. Uh, no, no, it, it, this principle that a function transforms identifications into identifications in, in book homotopy type theory, it's proved with path induction. Mm -hmm. But Michael Schumann wants to take another primitive. So uh, to convey more of the atmosphere of hot, I could add two considerations. The first one is that in HOT, we don't have only identifications at the first level of the type P identifies X and Y in type A, but we also have identifications at higher levels. For example, we can consider two identifications P and Q of X and Y, and we can have an identification of these two identifications in what is going to be the higher type equal sub x equal sub a y. So deeper identifications can be incarnated by continuous deformations of paths if we see identifications as homotopy paths. And then also path induction principle allows us to define composition of identifications and an inverse for each identification. So the property of equality <coughs> between identified objects lead naturally to a group structure on underlying in identifications. So in, in the hot book, 
you find the following table mm -hmm. where you have the properties of equality, reflexivity, symmetry <clears throat> are translated uh, as property of homotopy paths, constant paths, inversion of paths, concatenation of paths. <coughs> And at the group or group root level, identity morphism, inverse morphism, and composition of morphism. And then we have the principle. So we have the principle of univalence. And here we are going to meet or to cross <clears throat> my reflection about structural variance. Uh, univalence is an, is is again a new action. And I think that if I remember well. Uh, Michael Schulman, in his approach, he also proves univalence. Uh, this is a supplementary axiom. So, uh, it says that for two types, being equivalent and being equal are the same. So it seems to say that uh, isomorphic replicas, as I considered in my uh, part about structural variance, uh, they are, uh, after all, uh, they are treated as uh, case of equality by Hot. Uh, half of the assertion derives from path induction because uh, path and the, uh, induction proves that uh, if we have, uh, that there is a function it to equiv, which goes from the identity type between A and B in uh, the family of types U to uh, the type of equivalences between A and B. So we know by path induction that there is a, a function from this to this, but uh, the universe, the univalence axiom simply adds that this function is an isomorphism, mm -hmm. which means that we have the converse entailment, which means that the types may be identified when there is an isomorphic mapping from one to the other. So in, in HOT, it seems that we can identify objects as soon as they are equivalent. And this seems to agree with what we saw in the beginning, uh, that contemporary mathematical practice encourages us to and identify various cases of objects and structures. We mentioned isomorphic set theoretical structures or structured objects, equivalent objects in categories and equivalent categories. So, but I think that the situation is more com complicated if we looked as, at contemporary <clears throat> mathematical practice. We both wish to merge objects and to distinguish between them. I take two examples. Uh, first example is the, uh, when I built the set Z of relative integers by defining the equivalence relation R on ordered pairs of natural numbers. So, you know, it's this uh, X, uh, ordered pair X, Y is related to ordered pair X prime prime Y prime if X plus Y, y prime equal Y plus X prime. So doing that way, I reach an embedding from N to Z, which sends N on the class of N zero. And I may wish to identify N with class of N zero in order to have N as a subset of Z. And that's what uh, most treatises do. They, they, they say we identify, and nobody has any difficulty with that. Mm -hmm. But does it mean that uh, we forget once for all the difference? I think set theory helps us, helps us to keep track of the difference. Mm -hmm. After all, n and class, class of n zero are not the same uh, at the set theoretical level. Mm -hmm. And I think both are important for us. And uh, I, I take another example, which is more uh, shiny. Uh, which is the, equiv the well-known uh, equivalence of categories between affine schemes and rings. Mm -hmm. And you know that this mm -hmm. equivalence of category is given in one direction by uh, the era which associates to every ring A, uh, the, affine the affine scheme spec of A. And uh, 
it is for sure important to understand that affin schemes and rings are the same as categories. And uh, I know one treatise where it is written that uh, it's important to understand that we have the same categorical information mm -hmm. in both cases. But at the same time, it's impossible to deny that the construction of spec of A out of A has a great importance. It was, after all, Grotendieck's breakthrough. Uh, so we would like to be able to think the identity or the equivalence or the, the difference without concepts, but at the same time, we would like to keep the difference. We, we can, of course, do this in category theory as well, right? So we take the two categories, they are equivalent, but as soon as we equip them with forgetful functors to the category of set, yeah, they, they are not an equivalence of the forgetful, right? So they're just an equivalence of the abstract, it's not of the concrete. Category. So yeah. I, I agree we, with that. We don't have to turn this into an opposition between category theory and set. We can see this tension directly inside categories. I follow completely, and I wanted to say that uh, we use set theory as a way to keep track of the differences. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm not objecting at all. I just wanted to. Yeah, no, I understand. I don't, no. So, what what is the general lesson of how this? I don't know. It's just, it's just the, so the theory shows mathematical objectivity as undergoing identifications. And these identifications are local and they are provided by concern types. So we, if we have two points, two, two objects X and Y of type A, there is a type X equals sub A of Y of identifications of X and Y in A. Does it mean that differences behind uh, identified objects are without concept, not in an immediate and explicit way. Uh, uh, still path induction principle seems to tell us that identifications enfold identity, not as a case, but as a governing case. So perhaps identified objects behave like enfolding no conceptual difference, but cannot be sure of that. You, you find also in hot a notion of sets. And uh, what is a type is called a set in homotopy type theory. If for any two points of two objects, X and Y of type A, and for any two identifications, P and Q of X and Y, then P equal Q. So, it seems to mean that there is almost at most one identification between two objects. But it doesn't say that sets are discrete. I mean, uh, it doesn't say that elements of sets have strong identities facing each other and refusing any equality. Uh, two different objects may still be identified. But equality is made simpler by the existence of exactly one identification for any equal elements. So uh, in, in, in my two examples, that's the point Alex underlined, uh, set theoretical approach was the way to keep track of the differences between objects deserving to get identified, both in the case of N and of spec of A. So uh, Kant's vision of mathematics as a discipline allowing for difference without concepts is perhaps ventilated in a very large and foundational level by Hart. Identification seem to equal the different, while the theory still understands equality as governed by identity. Identific identifications look like repetitions to make it short. But does it really tell the whole story? I'm not sure of that, and I don't see how Hot helps us keeping track of the difference between equatable objects. I think that might be part of Mike Schulman's uh, goal. Re yeah, yeah. I think that's part of his concern in pro they, proposing they, this alternative. You, you told me something of that kind because you told me that his idea was to better understand equality as a basic principle. Yeah. So, so it, you, it, right. it would mean it would mean that I. Jean Michel, may I ask a very simple question <clears throat> concerning this topological path? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. The very simple topology. Famous. What is the topological path between these two objects? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You want me, you, you are taking an, an, an equality some in set theoretical methods. Mm -hmm. You, you are taking an equality in set theoretical mathematics, usual yeah, mathematics, yeah, exactly. uh -huh. and you ask me what is the identification. I don't know that because I, I, I would have to understand how do we correlate. Uh, it's type, just a I think I think type theory is another universe. I have only sets as a particular case of types. So then. I, the, the answer, I, I would have to know how to recover this case with types which are sets in homotopy type theory. But I don't know how they do that. I didn't read enough. But I'm curious of that. You're right. It, it's, it's a way, it, in a way, it's my question. I want to know how they keep track of uh, differences. And so it means that I would like to understand the relation between the equality of homotopy type theory and the equality of set theoretical classic theory. And I don't understand that. I think we have the same, we have the same problem. There is a paper by Leidemann and possibly taking I don't remember. Leidemann is one of the authors. There are two authors. Who's the author? Leidemann. So, and uh, I don't remember exactly about at this point uh, whether in the OTT, OTT, the notion of identity is the same notion or different notion. So that we need, according to them, we need a previous pre theoretical notion of identity that is. Uh, yeah. Uh, there. So, this has been a discussion. I can send you the. Yeah, yeah, thank you. For exactly the point that I discussed. In the and I remember that Michael Schulman, in in our recent conference, he was exactly uh, he was speaking of a of a, of a pre mathematical which would be concentrating us in our reflection on equality. So maybe it's it's about the relation with identity. And you yes. mentioned the BHK interpretation. Yes. Uh, there is also the realizability interpretation that fits mm. uh, close to this uh, paradigm. In yeah. fact, there you can try and explain something like a, a path between the two things you've written on the equality side. And there the, the idea is to have reasons to believe that this side is going to reach the other side within uh, a sufficient amount of time. <laughs> yes, it, it's, it's clean is realizability model <coughs> for analysis. Right. The path is the proof that those two are equal. Do, do it's a, a, a proof. A, a proof. Do, do, a path do, is do, a you, proof you, that you this limit that, uh, is equal to, okay. well, uh, e, e is just a symbol, but e, presumably you mean some alternative uh, definition. You no, know, a problem is that for it's some of the reasons, reasons, it is a definition, it could be a, a, a theorem also. <laughs> Right, right. But he, no, su no, but he suggests that the connection could be that uh, uh, an identifier of equality is a realizer of the proof of the equality. I, I, I'm, I'm ready to go for it, but I, for, at the point where I am, I don't understand. So uh, some words about categories in, in hot. Uh, we may define categories in hot, and the fact that uh, the notion of category, you know that uh, uh, when we have two objects in a category, uh, uh, the, the collection of morphisms from uh, one uh, the first object to the second object is supposed to be a set, which means that category theory uh, relies on set theory. Uh, uh, it's not a problem because we have sets in hot also. We just saw it. And uh, the first notion we reach is uh, the notion of pre-category. If, we re if we replicate the definition of a category within hot, 
what we define is what is called in hot uh, pre-category. And it's going to be only a proper category if it satisfies univalence. So a category is a pre-category which satisfies univalence, which means that when we have equivalent objects, they have to be equal. So uh, as I already said, when I presented the univalence principle, uh, the entailment from A equal B to e, A equivalent to B holds for because of path induction. We may suppose that we work on AA, and in that case, identity of A provides required isomorphism. So the main content is the other entailment that two equivalent objects are equal. And what we call a category is a pre-category where univalence holds. It's a pre-category where equivalent objects may be considered as So uh, it seems that Hot wants the notion of category as a notion validating univalence. Uh, and univalence means more than a logical dependence. It's not only that if A equal B, then A is equivalent of, uh, with B, is that uh, we have a functional dependence of, on, of identifications on isomorphisms and vice versa. But still, uh, this discourse about category as uh, validating univalence doesn't explain how we are going to keep track of uh, the distinction between isomorphic data. And that's my problem, as I already told you. But uh, I have to add that in some case, we can prove that a pre-category, which is built out of pre-categories and categories, is a category. For example, if A is a pre-category and B is a category, then B exponent A is a category. And also Hutt uh, seems to offer the possibility of expressing Bobaki's notion of structure. So in Bobaki, it's called espèce de structure, if you remember. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and this notion internalizes in Bobaki the set theoretical difference that concept. Uh, and the book shows that, a pre that the pre-category associated with standard notion of structure is indeed a category. So it seems that the, one of the main intentions of HOT is to provide a framework where univalence holds. I have the impression that univalence is not something uh, secondary in Hutt's approach. And uh, it, it, so it, it seems that Hutt is going to give as an a priori principle univalence, which is rather something which is pragmatically accepted in usual framework. Because we pragmatically accept that uh, N is going to be part of Z, for example. And we pragmatically accept that uh, rings and affine schemes are the same at the categorical level. Uh, but we don't make this uh, uh, pragmatically uh, uh, evident uh, obviousness. You don't make it as a real equality. So, uh, hot. Uh, so, I have nothing more to say. I already said everything. But, uh, hot seems to introduce uh, uh, identification as something which was which would put uh, uh, difference without concept at the center at the center of our problem but at the same time it doesn't which is very satisfactory in a way because i think mathematics is about difference without concept uh, but at the same time uh, i would like to uh, understand how we may also consider things as different even even when we equate them so that's the end of today. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.